Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So I want to talk about an experiment and the justification behind the experiment that I would hopefully like to do uh, during my time here in Switzerland. Uh, we'll have to see whether, the, whether we can get to it, but I just want to put the idea out there. Now, I talked about in the past how tungsten was uh, the first element that I believe um, someone saw a lot of transmutation in and I believe that was in the 1910s and it was Irving Langmuir and he found that when he was developing the tungsten filament light bulb that in his apparatus there was a production of something like 7,000 times the volume of gas uh, produced uh, than the weight of the tungsten uh, filament. And so the question was, where was this coming from? Now, there's some discussion as to whether there was water or some sort of uh, something uh, evaporating from some of the seals, uh, the way that they did the vacuum systems back then. But um, my hypothesis is that there is some water in there, and this was acting almost as a catalyst. And it was going to the tungsten filament, and it was uh, dissociating. And when it partially dissociates, as I've discussed in the past, you can produce uh, hydrogen, uh, uh, monatomic hydrogen, and uh, uh, the OH radical. And both of these are known to self-maze, uh, which will lead to coherence. And of course, you would imagine that the filament was a very consistent temperature, and so that would also be something that could get things uh, to be at the same de Broglie wavelength. And therefore... Um, what, what I am suggesting is that potentially what was happening is coherent matter was forming uh, and that this was able to cause the uh, basically the decay of tungsten and uh, one one thing that could be produced is it, what we've observed in the past uh, with a Mars gas and tungsten rod is the production of calcium and the sister product to that is Xenon and xenon obviously has a lot higher volume than the tungsten atom alone, and I believe the atomic volume of uh, calcium is about uh, two and a half times that of the atomic volume of tungsten. But we already know from Piantelli's work that in the case of nickel uh, interacting with uh, hydrogen isotopes that uh, protons are produced and I've argued that these protons are where you have the active agent working on the metal and as it's reorganizing the nucleons and when you've got this partial electronuclear collapse that periodically the fermion isotope of uh, protein, the single proton, is ejected from the cluster because it's uh, not a boson and this then becomes uh, a monatomic hydrogen that then fuses with another monatomic hydrogen and produces hydrogen gas which has a vast volume compared to something like tungsten if the same kind of process was to occur in tungsten and what I'm also suggesting is that therefore um, uh, the, the gas could actually have been uh, protons being produced by the coherent matter, the exotic vacuum objects, the, the itonic clusters, the microball lightning forming and interacting with the tungsten and producing a range of gases, uh, but all the way down to hydrogen itself. And uh, this could be a, a self-feeding process af after a while. And uh, we do know that um, tungsten filament light bulbs do tend to um, darken the inside of the filament and some of that is considered to be uh, sort of a physical vapor deposition um, but we also know that uh, Lena does produce carbon and uh, could it be uh, some carbon going on in there as well anyway the long and the short of it is uh, there's a long history so we start at 1910 and we have our, our tungsten uh, uh, filament but if we go all the way up to um, the work of uh, David Hudson. Uh, he, uh, in the 1980s, uh, found that if he, uh, he, he was trying to uh, get his, almost this monatomic gold, to um, return back to gold by using an electric arc furnace, and he uh, used this thumb size, like the size of my thumb here, electrode, he describes it, and he was bringing that down, uh, it was a tungsten electrode, uh, to try and kind of 
uh, return the monatomic gold to being gold or to try and find out what it was. And uh, the tungsten uh, electrode basically instantaneously disappeared. And he repeated this. And the manufacturer of the electric arc furnace says that this is basically impossible. Well, it happened and it was repeated according to the testimony of David Hudson. And then he... Um, uh, uh, found that on the walls of his laboratory where he was working, the glassware uh, uh, was crumbly. And this is very interesting because uh, we've identified that um, borosilicate glass, um, I've discussed this before, where in our original Chalani experiments I, th I, I expected potentially that the boron might be playing a role in the excess heat, and that also um, that that uh, neutron moderators or absorbers uh, like boron and in fact lithium of which uh, borosilicate glass can often contain a, a certain amount of lithium carbonate as a flux and uh, if it's got that in there and depending on where the carbons come from you've got all kinds of things that could interact with uh, condensates of cold neutrinos and whatever it was it had to have left this uh, arc furnace and uh, gone through the steel vacuum chamber, s traveled across the uh, volume of gas that was in the lab and interacted with the glass. And there was also some discussion about how the insulation on the electric wiring had been affected. Anyway, because of this, he decided that um, he would not uh, try and pursue this path because whatever it was doing to the glass concerned him. Now, around about that same time, you had Yul Brown saying that if we take uh, uh, any element and uh, we mix it uh, with iron shavings and aluminium uh, shavings and uh, we use uh, Brown's gas on it, uh, we will end up producing mostly carbon. And this is something that was established by Leclerc in the 2000s uh, in cavitation experiments. And also it was observed by uh, Takaaki Matsumoto in the 1990s and reported as such in fusion technology in 2001 I believe in a letter to the editor. So uh, carbon is something that's produced uh, and I have discussed why this is uh, because it is the first stable non-gaseous alpha conjugate nuclei uh, that uh, can be synthesized and uh, it obviously has in the form of diamond an extremely dense packing and this all fits with the idea of trying to fit things into a small box which an adiabatic self-compressing structure as discussed by Vysotsky and Adamenko in 2003 and uh, by uh, self-compressing uh, structure as discussed by Matsumoto in 1999 and earlier and also uh, the self-compressing in a, a cavitation system uh, uh, structure, coherent matter structure as discussed in 2012 uh, by um, uh, Roger Stringham. Uh, they're, they're all essentially talking about um, families of this same kind of uh, fitting things into a very small box. And uh, in the case of Roger Stringham, Stringham, he was saying that it was one fusion event that caused the thing to blow up. And I believe that it is more akin to what we have observed, where you have a vast number of nucleons uh, doing it at the same time. Well, when these things occur, some uh, uh, if you have a full electronuclear collapse, uh, there appears to be something coming out, and uh, this could be the uh, famous strange radiation, and this strange radiation would fit the bill for something that would have left the tungsten arc furnace of uh, uh, David Hudson and interacted with the glass. And this interaction with glass is something that we've also observed something similar in the Lion reactor, uh, although there were other things in contact, so it's a, a, a less certain thing there. But um, there is another case of uh, tungsten uh, in, uh, in the 1990s. Uh, it was a tungsten wire that was being used in electrolysis by Mizuno, I think in 1996. It might have been later that that was reported, actually, um, maybe in the 2000s. But anyway, um, he found supposedly an excess of around about 800 by looking at the rate of change of temperature rise in his uh, uh, cell. But obviously it, it was so violent that it blew the thing apart. 
And this also fits what was observed by the Sapphire team in 2017 when they had a lanyard probe made of tungsten basically instantaneously appear when, as I believe, it was entering into the sheath uh, at the coherent matter layer in a double, uh, double layer uh, that was sufficiently coherent. And this is something that I believe we have replicated a number of times with both Henk and Dave in Vega experiments where you have a tungsten wire and you get the ball lightning forming on it and it doesn't do much, it doesn't do much, you keep energizing it, you keep energizing it and then it gets to a critical state and it then instantaneously cuts the wire on the boundary of the coherent matter inside of the double layer. And so I believe that this is what uh, is going on and uh, when uh, Yul Brown was remediating Americium 241 and uh, co uh, Cobalt 60, he was using um, aluminium shavings and iron. Now, I think probably these are too violent, uh, being uh, fine particles or particle sponge, and probably not the best thing. We could just try uh, taking the tungsten uh, and making a pill from it and uh, applying the uh, Amazaga, the, the, the HHO rather, but it could be Amaza gas in my view. Uh, and uh, see if we can get this to uh, do something literally on its own without adding these other things. Um, uh, my argument with what Yul Brown was doing is the aluminium was uh, acting as a, 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 a highly uh, um, uh, conductive, uh, low melting point um, material which is monoatomic, which could cohere rather easily with the incoming uh, um, gas and that this would form the uh, solitons of two magnetic charges north and south as described by Solin in his December 1992 patent and that these would bind to the iron uh, being ferromagnetic until you get to the Curie point of iron in which case they're all released they produce these uh, clusters that then capture whatever material is in the vicinity and then you have this uh, self-compression and uh, instantaneous remediation. And he described it as, as you, you get like a glow uh, on the collection of materials. It glows, it glows, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then suddenly there's a big flash and then all the radioactivity is gone. And you can go and see this on Rex Research. I think it's on uh, a page uh, called uh, Fukushima Mon Amour or something like that. And you can go and see the accounts of how it, this radiation was immediately um, uh, fix. Now, we haven't got these radioactive sources to do that kind of test, uh, nor have we got the uh, right kind of environment to do that in, but I want to kind of do something by proxy. So, on the assumption that when these violent event occurs, there is this emission of this um, radiation that uh, uh, I believe, uh, and the Russians believe, is able to interact with beta isotopes. And so you would have Shishkin et al. saying this, and you would also have Alexander Parkamov. Certainly the, the temperature and the coherence can get to the point of producing this uh, uh, cold neutrinos when you go over a thousand degrees C, and then they cluster and so forth. So um, that might be part of the process that's going on. Uh, how can we do this kind of by proxy? So if we actually start with this, um, what, what we've got is we have a whole bunch of radioactive isotopes here, and these are uh, from spectrum techniques, and uh, we have a selection here. And the reason I've chosen uh, these uh, 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 for these kind of experiments is um, well essentially the, the 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 isotopes of choice for Alexander Parkamov were cobalt sixty and uh, strontium ninety yttrium ninety uh, and this is because the cobalt sixty has a five point two seven year half life and that decays is a beta uh, gamma decay and so he could use uh, his uh, uh, GM tube uh, to uh, or pancake or whatever it was to assess the and by by screening it with different layers of aluminium foil or whatever to discriminate from the monochromatic maximum energy uh, beta particle that comes out which is uh, 317 keV and uh, 0.317 MeV and that is a signature of uh, inverse beta decay that is where you are having a cold neutrino or a relic neutrino coming into the source and 
forcing the decay. So rather than getting a spectrum of decay energies in your beta particle, you actually end up with a huge uh, 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 predominance of the, well, you should only get the uh, high energy uh, 317 keV. So um, uh, that's the same for the strontium-90 uh, and uh, yttrium-90, but this, uh, the yttrium-90, strontium-90 has 28.8 years, and this is one of the main isotopes that comes out of uh, something like Fukushima. And uh, this is, um, uh, it's, it's an analogue of calcium, and so the bod uh, humans and, and animals, they absorb it and it replaces calcium in their bones, and then, then it is there emitting these horrible uh, 546 kV betas, but also uh, the yttrium-90 that it decays to has a 64.1-hour uh, half-life, and that get, produces a 2.28 MeV uh, beta. So... Um, uh, that is uh, uh, really one of the worst isotopes, along with cesium-137, that can come from something like uh, uh, Fukushima. And um, the other one we've got here, polonium-210, this is actually a 138-day um, half-life alpha uh, emitter. Now, uh, if we have got uh, some form of... Uh, neutrino condensates coming from our tungsten, uh, then um, they should not uh, if, uh, interact in a way that causes polonium-210 to decay. So uh, I'm going to describe, uh, I'm going to pause the video here and I'm going to just uh, make another video and describe uh, what I'm going to do for the experiment. Um, if we can get to that uh, at some point, we'll do it, but let's hope we, we can get to it in the next uh, couple of days. Thank you very much for your time. I'll see you in the next video.